Hi! Uh, welcome to this month's um, episode of I Like Being a Kid, our podcast here for the Radcliffe Parish Library. Um, so yeah, this month uh, we will be talking about Maurice Sendak. We'll be talking about... Richard <laughs> Pett. Yes. Also talking about our summer reading program a little bit, but we have a special guest too. Do you want to introduce yourself? Feels <laughs> like a kid today. <laughs> so, uh, hey, my name is uh, DC Sills, and I'm honored to be here to talk to y'all about the first book I've written, Forever So. I will say DC is sort of like maybe our only fan girl. <laughs> when I messaged her and said, "Will you be on the podcast?" She was like, "I'm watching it right now." <laughs> I was like, "I love that." It definitely made our heart happy. We're hoping to pick up more fans in the future, <laughs> but for now, DC may be our number one. You should have more fans. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very educational. Uh, like I never knew that you know the same man who wrote Polar Express wrote Jumanji. Really? I was like, yeah. "What? You got to be kidding me!" So, I know. Yeah. Yeah, so this, uh, as you know, we are in summer reading right now. Our theme for the summer is all together now, which kind of is very inclusive and lots of different directions you can go with that. So for this podcast, we are um, just recognizing that we at RPL love all members of our community. So we are um, including some really amazing ones um, this time, um, both authors and local authors as well. Um, so yeah, we're going to go ahead and kick it off and ask you some questions. <laughs> Um, so, DC, would you like to introduce your book yeah. for us? Sure. Uh, my book is right here, <laughs> The Man of White Show, and uh, it's called Forever So. And uh, basically, a um, little background on me is I'm an ordained minister here in town and ordained through the Disciples of Christ denomination. And my personal theology is that everybody is loved and worthy, and we don't have to do anything to be that, and we don't have to do, we can never lose it. So uh, that's really what the crux of the book. And I don't think we hear that enough these days, uh, or anybody hears that enough, from children to adults. And if we lived our lives that way, maybe we'd have a different kind of world sometimes. So. Um, that's wonderful. Could you talk about the journey of like writing forever so? Like, uh, how did it come <laughs> to your mind? Um, and how did it get published? Well, picture it, Sicily. <laughs> okay. uh, my my wife woke up one morning and said, um, hey, I had a dream that you wrote a children's book. And I was like, I don't write books. I write songs. I don't write books. And she's like, eh, it's the same thing. And so I'm like, sure. And she just kept saying, you really need to write a children's book. I feel like you have a children's book in you. And so I was like, okay, whatever. And so I just started writing. And for about a year and a half, it stayed in the notes on my phone. And I would write a little more and go back and edit and do things and I just never did anything to with it and then I read it to her one day and she was like you really need to, to get somebody to illustrate that because I cannot illustrate and uh, a, a student that she had taught in junior high and that I knew through the UBU youth group through class um, had posted some pictures on his Instagram page and I loved the style and it was really cool and so I said hey you ever illustrated a book and he was like nope but I'd love to try so I gave him the words of the book, and he, I don't want to say he wept, but he cried. And he said, I wish we'd add this book when I was growing up. And I can't wait to give this book to my niece when she's born. And uh, we started our journey from there. And about a year and a half later, it is what you see before you right now. And um, I'm very thankful for Pete. Uh, both of us, neither one of us knew what we were doing. <laughs> but we kept on going anyway. And now give a shout out. What's your illustrator's name? Uh, Pete Gorham. All right, yeah. Peter <laughs> Felix. <laughs> and uh, Pete's an art major at uh, Northwestern. And so for all of your uh, illustration needs or, or graphic <laughs> art needs, Pete would love to help you out. And But uh, he did a great job with the book. We wanted to make sure the book was inclusive of most people that we could think of. And I... He did a great job of, of doing that, and, and basically we went back and forth a little bit on, hey, let's add this or that, but pretty much he saw the vision and he knew what he wanted it to look like, and we wanted to make sure if somebody opened the book, they would see themselves in there. Awesome. So um, the book is also a sing-along, oh. and uh, so as a songwriter, I felt like we had to have a, a sing-along, and as a, a minister and a pastor also thought that it should be like a refrain so it can be read like like that as well that you have a, a refrain in the middle of, of the book I will say I know it's written as a children's book but uh, my daughter who 
is in high school. Her choir teacher read it to them every day. Maybe sang it. I didn't realize it was they a single they they yeah. It. But yeah, um, so shout out to Marie Dunning at Bolts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, because Lily was like, I've heard it so many times. Yeah, she was like, I know that book. Because they, yeah, she was like, my kids need to hear this every day. Yeah, that's been yeah. A, a, a very prideful point for me is yeah. that, that they have embraced the book as much they as really they have. have. Uh, at Indie Fet la a couple weeks ago, uh, they were doing a performance at uh, at River Fet, and they stopped in front of my booth where I was selling uh, books and sang oh, the, oh the chorus God. of the song to me. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, they heard it every day. Marie really was like, my kids always need to hear this, and yeah, Lily has loved it. It's been really special to them. And you know, in the end, like everything, and probably every writer would tell you this: that you write what you need. Right. And and not it was it's a it's a message I need every day. So yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing, and I'm so glad because I didn't know that it oh, yeah. was getting that type of um, outreach. You know, so I'm really glad yeah, to hear been, that it it's is been very humbling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What was it like making the song, the piano accompaniment, putting the QR code on there so that they can go to the song and everything for forever? So. Um, that that took a little time because I'm not a piano player, and but I wanted it to be a piano because most people sing along to piano music more, mm -hmm. and I wanted it to be more kid friendly than that. Mm -hmm. Although I am thinking about getting Bolton's choir to sing it and then yes. replace it in the book for the next edition. I love to. So, yeah. <laughs> so I just think that would be a beautiful piece for it. But uh, so yeah, um, I had a couple people come in and play piano. Uh, Dwayne Bonds, who's the principal at oh. Bolton, played. A, piano oh, wow. part on there oh, okay. and uh tanya vadreen who's the pianist at first christian church she also played piano so it's a little mixture of them oh, yeah. and i added a couple little things in the background and just sang it pretty simply so that people could sing along yeah oh, it nice. was i cannot carry a tune but it was a very approachable <laughs> melody for me i was like i could do this yeah you want to be like a wild and he gets real excited like we were going to ask him that was correct harmony and he was like what <laughs> like, he was so was proud, very proud. <laughs> he was like i don't know what i did but yeah i mean he was like a harmony <laughs> <I'm laughs> <sorry. laughs> yeah yeah um and so you had mentioned pete how was working with him it was great pete made differ but uh <laughs> like i said neither one ever really knew what we were doing so we just kind of plunged forward and pete would send me pictures and i would say oh that's great or change this or change that but very little of changes or change that mm -hmm. um he just had a great feel for it and and it was it was a good transition it was smooth uh and and seeing pete blossom through yeah. through illustrating the book and seeing his confidence grow in himself as an artist has has been great for me um, because I just think that's a beautiful yeah. thing is to watch somebody embrace their art and embrace their true selves mm -hmm. and, um, and realize that, Hey, I can, I can actually do yeah. this for a living. Yeah. <laughs> you want to pay me to do, to do what I want to do. Yeah. So. And it's so good that he's making that realization whenever he's still in school right. for it, right. you yeah. know, so that he can even have more of an incentive to hone his skills. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been, it's been a fun ride. Yeah. Now you chose to self-publish. Do you want to talk about, you know, why you felt like that was the right choice for you? Um, it was probably the lazy choice. No. Uh, because uh, because self-publishing, I didn't have to go through anybody editing in or telling me this is wrong or I should do this different or you should use this word instead of that word. Although I did have a very frightful moment. Uh, my wife teaches at Tyoga Junior High and she sent me a text one day and said, hey, I passed the book around to some of the teachers and they have some edits. And I was like, <laughs> and if you are a creative person or even if you're just a person in general when somebody criticizes you it's like yeah. oh no yeah. you know they hated it i mean of course my worst fears were they hated it the corrections were i would use the instead of then in this sentence and i would put a comma here since you use comma in this one yeah, I was like, oh, edits are not a bad thing. They're not <laughs> criticism. I know, but I was just like, my first thought was, you know, everybody's first thoughts are always it's terrible. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. that's what we do to okay. ourselves. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, definitely. I remember um, creative writing um, classes that I took, and like the workshop days were always the most fretful because mm. I was like, what are they gonna say? You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you. 
I'll tell on you. Oh, it's so great. Oh, Thanks to my friend. <laughs> Occasionally, Craig will come to me with like a program idea or something, and he's like, my, and I'll just be like, okay, or well, what if we did this? Is and he'll just look at me and like crumple the paper, like forget this. <laughs> and I'm like, well, no. Um, sometimes, <laughs> That's not what I said. Yeah. <laughs> but I always go back. He does. He does. Um, yes. Yeah. Craig has what I would call immediate dramatics. <laughs> <laughs> they, they settle. And he's fine, but yeah, he's like, it's garbage. It's garbage. I'm like. Wow. <laughs> that, is, that is certainly true. I can't argue against that very much. But that is our process. And then we come to the end where it's basically your program with a tiny tweak and we're all fine. Yeah. That's our um, process. So do you have any more? And let me, <laughs> let me detract from that. Um, do you have any other plans to write any other books? Or um, any plans to write other books? I don't know. It, I, I would say yes because it's been a, a nice process. Yeah. It's, been, yeah. it's been fun. And, and now that I know I can lay things out, that don't don't have to have well this one does have music but that doesn't have to have music behind it um i i probably would you know okay. like um i actually started one this week about my dog oh uh, her name is blanche dubois uh, <coughs> oh she my relies God. on the comfort of strangers i love uh, or the kindness of strangers sorry yeah. Kenzie, but... <laughs> <laughs> i don't forgive you i'm sure yeah. um I don't well, think he's watching <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I never <laughs> certainly well, we would like to present an opportunity for you to read your book oh. um, on our podcast if you'd like to. Sure, that'd be great. Okay, great. I'm excited. I've never heard of DC read the book, so oh, I'm very yeah. excited. Excuse me, I'm on a time. <laughs> now, my mom was a second grade teacher. Ah. Okay. So I don't think I'll do as good reading as she would, but because you know, she does the whole like thing. But uh, It's I've a process learning to read upside down. Yeah. yeah. It's a skill. Y'all are I, should, I, should, <laughs> I should know this well enough not to have to do that. So, <clears throat> from the tip of your head to the bottom of your toes, there's one thing that you should always know. No matter how old you are or how far you go, you are loved and you are worthy, and it will be forever so. Now, if you check the book out of the library or you buy your own copy, you can scan this QR code and it will play the music and you can sing along. But for now, you'll get me singing. <laughs> you are loved, you are worthy, you are loved, you are worthy, you are loved forever so. I may need a page for that. <laughs> From lash to heel, and head to toe, and all parts in between, the parts people see and the parts that go unseen. There's a light within you that's meant to shine, not just at night, but all of the time. You are loved, you are worthy, you are loved, you are worthy, you are loved forever so. From the inside out and the outside in, each day is a day to begin again. Make each day better than the one before. Go to sleep each night, ready to wake to one more. You are loved, you are worthy, you are loved, you are worthy, you are loved forever so. From your brain to your soul, if there's ever a time that you feel that you don't feel whole, like something is missing and that your light shine burns low. Be open to others when they proclaim that they will lift you up and share their flame. Now, if you're watching at home, we've done this enough times that you can sing along now. You are loved, you are worthy, you are loved, you are worthy, you are loved forever so. Now, there will be times that you feel that you're the odd person out, and the world will leave you filled with questions and doubts. Are you enough? Are you too hard to love? Believing in a devil below and wondering if there's a God up above. But hold tight and know that from lash to heel and head to toe, you are worthy and loved forever and always. It will be so. And some days will be high and the others will be low, but together we will all continue to glow. Bright against the sky, leaving love in our wake, all working together to make the world a better place. 
And it all starts with me and it all starts with you, knowing for sure this one simple truth, that from lash to heel and from head to toe, we are all worthy and loved, and it will be forever so. Because you are loved, you are worthy, you are loved, you are worthy, you are loved forever so. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. Yeah. Now I know your books are here at the library if you want to check them out, but if someone wanted to purchase it, how would they go about doing that? Uh, they can contact me. Okay. They can hunt me up on the Book of the Face or the Facebook if you want to go <laughs> uh, at dc.sills, uh, or they can buy it directly from the publisher, which is lumu.com. Okay. Awesome. And uh, just do a search for Forever So, and it'll, it'll pop up. Awesome. Right. So, so thank y'all. Yeah. Thank so you. you. Yeah. Um, we were really happy to have you. I know. I was excited okay. to be here. Yeah. It's an honor. Um, well, we would like to take a quick break. And talk about our summer reading program, which begins, uh, which began June first. Um, so we have some stuff for children, we have some stuff for teens, and we have some stuff for adults as well. Um, for children, you can win prizes. Um, for 150 minutes of reading, you can get a certificate. For 750 minutes, you can What's the get. the age limit for the children? Wow. Yeah, yeah, the age limit is from zero to 12. Um, ah, no, but so there's adult, yeah, but so yeah. people ask that often. They're like, oh, my kid doesn't read yet. We consider those pre-readers and books you read to them oh. count. So, yeah, yeah. they yeah. we had babies win little summer reading medals <laughs> on their necks. It's the cutest thing ever, yeah. yeah. And often we have, like, older siblings reading to the base, so then they both, yeah, That's awesome. win. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, So you can count the book that DC just read you for your minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. sure. Mm -hmm. Audio books count, so listening, yes. <laughs> yes, certainly. Um, 750 minutes get you a color changing cup. They change from like this frosty clear white to a frosted blue. Um, then we have an all together now bingo, which has like different tasks, um, different like reading tasks, um, attending a library or a program or a library program or story time and various things like that. In fact, I noticed one of your, um, illustrations showing, a couple picking up litter mm -hmm. and that is one of the ways in which you can get um you can mark off your bingo is if you clean up litter or have nice. an hour of volunteering oh, yeah we have those cool litter kits that you can check out from the library right now when it comes with like the little grabbers some bags gloves things to help us beautify the state but particularly our area so you can check those litter like cleanup kits at the branches so yeah if you yeah. want to do that just your family or if you have say a I don't know, a church group or a little Boy Scout troop or anyone who wants to do that, we have those kits available for it check It always out. amazes me the different things you can get from the library. It's a lot I mean, of just think books, but there's so much. It's not your grandma's library. library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we do our best to have access to as many things as possible. You know, I have to admit, whenever I started working here, I was surprised about that as well. Yeah. Um, and very pleasantly so. Mm -hmm. And then the big prize, which Carla um, mentioned, Sorry. you're good. No, we appreciate it. Is the fifteen hundred minutes, which you get a reading medal um, yeah. for, and yeah, you get to attend our reading ceremonies and or our reading medal ceremonies and yeah. everything. So we do our best to make a big deal of it. But yes. there are prizes for children, teens, and adults. So there mm -hmm. is an adult summer reading prize. <laughs> yeah. So no, fear not. And tons of programs. I mean, there are. I mean, crafts and arts and book clubs and educational. I mean, there's we have programs all year long, but summer we, we pack them in. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot, lot to attend. Computer classes. There's some amazing. Yeah, so yeah. Definitely check it out. And definitely. Um, we also have entertainment for children, which anybody can come to. Um, right. We have Zach Morgan, who is coming on the week of the 12th through the 16th, and he is a singer and storyteller. Nice. Um, so we're pretty excited to have him. We're also really excited to have Reggie Harris on the week of June 26th through the 30th. And he is a musician and he presents about black history. He's going to be 
talking about like the underground, underground. railroad. I'm excited yeah. about really that. Excited. I'm excited. Come yeah. um, for that one. Yeah, yeah please do. Yeah. Um, July 10th through the 14th, we have a drummer who was on the Correct Me If I'm Wrong Off Broadway Off show Stomp. Stomp. Yeah. Um, for 10 years, yes. Yeah. And she's going to be here from July 10th through the 14th having a drumming show. And she's another one that, yes, it's a children's show, but. She's got a big following with like the high school band. Oh, oh people yeah. People around here, a lot, yeah. and a lot of adults come to see her too. I mean, she's a really, you know, mm-hmm. world renowned percussionist. Yes. So, yeah, yes. come yes. see her. Yeah, and um, for July 24th through the 28th, we're going to have um, a local author, ML Tarpley, um, Morgan Tarpley. And she's going to be helping kids sort of create their own stories and making them come to life. So yeah, so we've kind of given you chunks of a week there, but um, check um the website, Facebook, call your local branch. These shows will happen at every one of the ten library branches. So if you're wondering what day and time is it at mine, you can look on our website, our Facebook, but also call your local branch, and they can let you know. Hey, we're Tuesdays at ten, or whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah. We could shout, we could spout them off, but that's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, and um, transitioning over to teens, we'll get to adults, I promise. <laughs> um, teens have a, an opportunity to win two prizes as well. Um, the first one is a string of like photo string lights with like, oh, cute. Um, oh, cute. oh gosh, they're like not the paper clips. Clothes pens, like. Yes, clothespins. I always forget that word. And um, you can hang pictures or really anything that you want on them, and you win that by reading just five hours throughout the summer. And then we have another one, which is a beanie um, that you can win by attending five library programs. You should have worn a beanie for that. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's okay. Oh, it's burgundy. It's yeah. really cute. Yeah. I do <laughs> love the burgundy beanie. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we've got for teens. Um, we have hole punches so that we can punch your um, card at every program. And then... Adults. Finally, for adults, <laughs> um, every bit of reading that you do helps you. It's basically like a raffle mm-hmm. for a drawing that's going to be at each branch for a fifty dollar gift card from a local business of wow. your choice. Nice. Yeah, so that's exciting. Yeah, so mm-hmm. definitely be reading. I mean, we want everyone to read, but especially kiddos and teens. If you do not pick up a book from the time you left school to the time you go back in August, your reading level is going to be lower than it was when you left. And we yeah. don't want that. You worked so hard. <laughs> so yeah. even just a little bit of reading in the summer really helps you maintain. And then if you read a lot, you could you could start out right. Yeah, above where you were. So we yeah, we want you guys to keep reading. It's super important. I'm and joking. there's no AR test in the summer. We don't care what level you're, you read. Whatever. Right. But also, <laughs> it's fun. if you want to read and uh, stock yeah. up on them and just start the just school year with a whole lot. Just AR test at mm-hmm. the beginning. Man, get that score up there. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. Just going to let you know that's what I did. Um, so. Well, I am too old to have done AR, but we digress. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, I'm so All right. But now we're going to dive into our authors for this month. So um, this month I did the picture book author, um, and I chose Maury Sendak. Mm-hmm. So I was excited. I did not know a lot about Maury Sendak. I knew um, where the wild things are, and I knew in the night kitchen, and that was sort of my knowledge yeah. of him. So just to give you a little background, um, he was born in June 10th. Uh, 1920 in Brooklyn, New York, and that's where he lived um, almost all of his life. Um, he died May 8th, um, 2012. Um, he is an author. He was an author and an illustrator. I think he, he described himself more as an artist and illustrator, but he did write these books as well. <laughs> if you ever watch interviews of him, he is a self-described curmudgeon. <laughs> he was a grumpy man. <laughs> he was a little quirky. I mean, I, I find his interviews hilarious and fascinating, but some of the stuff I was like, I can't share that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, now I'm going to go I, watch some interviews. But he was a grump, kind of. But that was, he kind of liked that. Yeah. Maurice Sendak is one of my more favorite um, <laughs> he children's was, He was something, yeah. Um, so, yeah, of the, the most famous book people would know of his is Where the Wild Things Are. Um, and one of my favorite things he talked about um, he had a little, I'm going to read this actually, the quote. He said, a little boy sent me a charming card with a little drawing on it. I loved it. I answer all my children's letters, sometimes very hastily, but this one I lingered over. I sent him a card and I drew a picture of a wild thing on it. Dear Jim, I loved your card. 
So then he got a letter back from the mother and it said, Jim loved your card so much that he ate it. <laughs> that to me was the highest compliment I've ever received. He didn't care that it was an original Maury Sendak drawing or anything. He saw it, he loved it, he ate it. <laughs> oh, so gosh, I love that. <laughs> And that's very much, that was like the highest honor for him. Here's the next one. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he did win lots of awards, but he did not put much stock in awards. He was like, he was like, ah, oh, it's all garbage. You know, people read what they read. <laughs> but he did win lots of awards, so we'll get to. Um, he was born to um, Polish um, Jewish immigrant parents. Um, his mother's name was Sadie. Yeah, Sadie. His father was um, Philip. He was a dressmaker. Um, he was the youngest of three. Um, his brother Jack was also a children's book author as well. Um, then he had a sister who was nine years older. But um, he um, said his, he described his childhood as quite terrible. Honestly, he um, he was introduced to mortality at a very early age. A lot of his extended family was killed in the Holocaust. So he, um, yeah, was introduced to death and bad things at a very early age. And I think that really, you know, influenced yeah. his way of thinking and yeah so um, his art too yeah for sure yeah his art is so interesting i will say he is not one of those illustrators that i immediately pick up a book and say well that's maurice syndex they're so varied like mm -hmm. his art is very different depending on the book and i i love that like he he had some some range <laughs> for sure um he was um sick a lot as a child so he was confined to bed and that's kind of how he fell in love with books he had Nothing else to do except lay there and read books. Um, so, yeah. He said when he was 12 years old, he saw Fantasia. And that is what made him say, I want to be an illustrator. Like, that's what I want to be. I want to be an artist and an illustrator. Um, he did, before he wrote his own books, he illustrated the entire Little Bear series. I don't know if you knew that, but he was the illustrator of Little Bear. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see. Um, okay, yeah. I'm skipping along. Oh, yeah. So, In the Night Kitchen. Let me pull that one up. So this one, um, if you've never read it, it is, it's, one of, it's an old one. I want to say 19, 1970. Yeah. It is one of the earliest um, widely banned books that there was. So, um, and he, he did say that, too. He was like, my work's often controversial. Um, but there, still to this day, it's on ALA's most banned list. From 1990 to 2000, I want to say it was number 21 on the list um there the little boy um what is his name i'm gonna forget oh no what is his name mickey yes i was like search the name mickey um kind of runs through in a dreamlike state and little mickey is naked <laughs> in several pictures um yeah i mean it's not graphically drawn but there's you know the shape of a naked boy <laughs> in there so um it was very controversial at the time Still to this day, some people hmm. have protested this book. So it was, he was one of the first wow. to have challenged banned books. Um, yeah, in the night kitchen. <laughs> I said that. It was, yeah, he definitely was one of the first for that. Um, like I said, um, where the wild things are is probably why you know Mari Sendak. They made a movie of it. Um, and it's such a cool book. Like, I love the dreamlike state of it. Max, it, he's just mad because his mom made him go to bed without supper, I think. Like, I'm trying to remember. It's been a minute since I read it. But, um, and he just goes, there's all these, like, this one actually was controversial at the time, too, because people said the monsters were grotesque and scary. And oh. so, yeah, poor, well, he didn't care. He liked it. I think <laughs> people didn't, they weren't kind of not thinking his books were always appropriate for children. Um, but, yeah, they thought it was too scary, the monsters in here. So, and then let's see, I'm going to pull up outside over there. Um, in an interview, he did say that this was hit to him his most important book, like the most important book to him. He went to Germany um, and he was writing some, or he was illustrating some like Hans Christian Andersen type stuff. And he said he sort of fell in love with the German romantics and that whole. And so this art is very, it's pretty in a creepy way. <laughs> Say. like the eyeballs are a little weird but um it doesn't give the classic you know where the wild things are look to it it's very almost watercolory and ethereal but in a creepy sort of way right, right. like you never look at that cover and say oh yeah but it's definitely got some there's some fairy tale vibes to it but some of the um darker original fairy tale type, yeah but he said this was yeah 
Can we take a quick pause? Of course. Unless I'm badly mistaken, outside over there is actually the inspiration for Jim Henson's Labyrinth as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, so the movie with David Bowie yeah. and, yeah. That makes a lot so. of sense because he did work with Jim Henson. Also, he was on the, um, I forget the name of it, but it's the National Children's Television, some kind of committee at that time, uh, at the time when Sesame Street actually came out. But he did work with Jim Henson, so that... That tracks. <laughs> that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, he actually also produced an animated series called Really Rosie, and Carol King was the voice of Rosie huh. in Maurice Syndex. Yeah, a little, little show. Um, so, yeah, he wrote all these books, um, and he he had kind of a second career later. Um, he designed sets and costumes for ballets and operas. So his father was a dressmaker, so he had that you know training, um, and that was kind of his second um artistic endeavor after the books were most of the books were done I mean he was still he wrote this book um, my brother's book came out in 2013 which he died in 2012 so it came out after he passed away um, but it's beautiful they described it as an elegy to his brother Jack but also to his partner Glenn um, but it's yeah it's a beautiful book I mean if you're, it's very poetic and read this one I mean read them all <laughs> if you get a chance um, yeah and it's it's creep like dark yeah but beautiful there's a bit more of like a mature vibe to it though. yeah like i don't think i would use this as a children's no, no, bedtime no, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh -huh. there's a darkness to it uh but it's very poetic and the art is a little dark too but it's yeah, yeah i i just found it interesting it's unlike anything else he had <laughs> And like Craig was saying, he thinks perhaps if this had come out in his lifetime, he might not say that was his most important. Like this seemed very right. much who he was. Dear to him. Yes. Yeah. So um, almost like that was his swan song. Yeah, yes. definitely. Um, so yeah, um, he um, lived with his partner Eugene David Glenn for over fifty years, um, and then Eugene died in two thousand seven. Um, he did say of his parents, um, and let me find that exact quote. I don't want to misquote him. Um, he said that um, all I ever wanted to do was make my parents happy. Um, and so they never, never, never knew. So he never came out to his parents. Um, he didn't feel like that was something he could do. Um, but he was with Glenn for 50 years um, when Glenn passed away. And he later, um, he made large donations to different places. There's like, I think like a building made in Glenn's honor now and think lots of yeah. things. But um, yeah, so he they were together for... He was, Glenn was, Eugene Glenn was a psychoanalyst. They were together for, yeah, 50 years. Um, he was, Maury said that in classic, he said, nobody better make a, what do you say, don't make a statue of me. I don't want children climbing on me. I won't have it. <laughs> so um, he um, was cremated, and his ashes were scattered at an undisclosed location. So you cannot go and mourn Maury Sendak at his place of rest because we don't know where it is. And that's classic. So that our children will not be. No. <laughs> He's like, I won't have it. Yeah. Um, but he is, this book won the Caldecott Medal. Um, he also had some other Caldecott Award books. These are just his books that he wrote. I mean, the number of books he illustrated for other people. I mean, I want to say it's close to 100. I mean, there were lots. So he wrote several, but he also, and like I said, he considered himself more of an illustrator than an author. He actually said in an interview, he was like, I've never written a children's book. I don't even know how you would do that. I was like, <laughs> He was so quirky. Hey, can we do another quick yes. one? So, uh, um, but one of the authors that she mentioned was George MacDonald, mm -hmm. who inspired Tolkien and C.S. Lewis of um, Narnia and Middle Earth. So, I'm so, sorry. No, no. I was just going to mention a few. Like I said, he was a Caldecott Medal winner, National Book Award winner, Hans Christian Andersen Award, um, Laura Ingalls Wilder, National Medal of Art. Um, he had two honorary doctorates, one from the University of Connecticut and one from Goucher College. Um, and he was inducted into the New York Writers Hall of Fame in 2013. Uh, yeah, and that were, those were just a few of the main awards. He won won lots of them, but again, he put no stock in awards. That, that little boy who ate his letter was the highest honor he could possibly get. <laughs> but yeah, so Maurice Sendak was fascinating to me. I knew his book, but I did not. I have loved learning about him. He is fascinating. But Can you tell them the story of me reading Brundy Bar? To you and Lauren, uh, it was so. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 tell um, me. Yeah, I had read it. It was a book that he wrote with Tony Kushner, um, the oh, author yeah. of the play Angels in America, 
And whenever it's from like Charles. Uh, really? Oh, oh my gosh. Um I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing. Um but I, whenever she said that she was talking about Maurice Sendak, I was like, oh, well then let me bring this book to you. And I just start reading it. And it was a lot more chaotic than I remember. Um, I was like, what is happening? <laughs> like, I could, I was like, that is not a good read aloud for children because I couldn't follow the through line. I was like, no, wait, but what, what are they doing? <laughs> I had a hard time following it. take notes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Definitely. There was more than one pause where I had to ask, no, wait, but remind me, this was that. <laughs> I couldn't keep up with the book. Yeah, it's definitely a book that you need to pay attention to the <laughs> illustrations and the words at the same time. Yeah, to be fair, I was typing whilst Craig was reading. It was a bad idea. But... And plus a lot, it doesn't help that it's written in like comic panels. So if you don't know how to like uh, navigate yeah. that as well. Okay, I know how to. No, no, no. I know how to know. <laughs> I was saying that I had a hard time right. navigating and it. That's not the point. I did not mean for it to. I'm so sorry. That's, that's a good thing. I, I appreciate that. But yeah, so that is Maurice Sendak. He was fascinating. And if you get a chance, read some of his, watch some of his interviews. Um, he's He was something. <laughs> yeah. Um, are we ready to yes. talk about Richard Peck? Richard okay. Peck. Richard Peck was born on April the 5th, 1934, in Decatur, Illinois. And that was where he spent a lot of his childhood. He described it as the middle of middle America. He actually uses the phrase middle middle America, but I was like, that's not going to make sense if I say that. Um, it's, make, it's better in typing. Um, he grew up around a whole lot of his elders because his mother had six siblings um, along with her to make seven kids in total. And his maternal grandmother had a lot of siblings as well. So he just grew up around all of those stories and the stories that um, the curmudgeon old men at his father's Philip 66 gas station would tell. <laughs> So he just learned their way of speech and their way of life and was sort of prepared to write books such as A Long Way from Chicago and a Year Down Under. That makes so much sense. Yeah. When I think of Richard Peck books, he was around old men in oh, the gas I love that. Definitely. That um, tracks. <laughs> and, and in fact, he has a direct quote that says, from my father, I learned nostalgia as an art form, which I just I love. love that. That's a lovely quote. Yeah. yeah. He's got like a really a lot of really good ones. Um he grew up next to a large city park, which throughout the years housed a racetrack, county fairgrounds, an amusement park, and he often talked about his experiences traveling around that area. Um, which may I just say I'm very glad that I was able to find as much information about him as possible because the first thing or that I did, not as possible, but um one of the first things that I found was, oh, famously private, Richard. <laughs> and I was like, no. Changing um, authors now. Yeah, I was concerned that I would have like a grand total of like five minutes. See, we announced it. We announced it in the podcast, so we should do a little bit of pre-research. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so he often talked about his experiences traveling around that area and exploring it. Um, and then whenever he was around like 18, he moved to New York and he sort of stayed there for the majority of his life. Like he would float around, travel abroad and different things like that. But he sort of always focused on New York as his home. Um, he went to New York City for the first time at 16 years old. And this might make a lot more sense or make him make a lot more sense as well. He went at 16 to visit a relative who worked at the UN, um, which I was like, Oh, and then whenever I was watching some interviews with him, he very much talked like someone who um, would have a relative in the UN, like talked like relatives of like politicians and things yeah. like that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. It makes sense to me. I don't know if... Um, <laughs> had a bigger worldview than just middle, middle America. Yes, <laughs> certainly. Thank you for voicing it for me. <laughs> Um, and then he, with the help of a particularly challenging English teacher um, in his senior year, um, like basically he was like, okay, you want this to happen, I'm going to make it happen and you're going to hate me for it. Um, he gained a scholarship to DePaul University in Greencastle um, with a plan to become a teacher, which he eventually was able to accomplish. 
He spent a year in his undergrad um, traveling and studying abroad in England. And then he came back, graduated with a bachelor's in English literature. And he served for a couple of years in the US, in Germany, um, and did a lot of, like a lot of his work was writing things like sermon notes um, and other things in Germany. And he got his master's in English in 1959 from the Southern Illinois University. And he continued his studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he started teaching high school at Glenbrook North High School in Illinois before moving back to New York City, where he taught at Hunter College High School. I couldn't ever pin down the, which one of these it was, but one of these was like an all girls school. And he sort of used a lot of his experiences there as ideas for his books. Um, and he made the important realization, and I, another quote that I love, people don't read fiction to be educated, they read fiction to be reassured and to be given hope, which I really wow. liked, yeah. yeah. Um, the interview, which is odd because the interview that I saw with him made me think that he would say things like the exact opposite because he said, oh yeah, I'm listening to these teens and they say words like, like, and you know, and I was like, I say those all the time. <laughs> um, and he was like, yes, the next time that you hear somebody who says, you know, all the time, just say, no, I don't know. And I was like, the Richards! <laughs> 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 But, and I think that he was talking with a couple of teens, and from what I could tell, they seemed uncomfortable with the <laughs> comments as well. Um, yeah, but he went home in May of 1971 to go home and write a novel, so he quit teaching to go write his first novel. It was his first work, Don't Look and It Won't Hurt, and it was published by Holt in 1972. The book talked about teenage pregnancy, actually, which I think is... Uh, Huh? Yeah, going Actually, right out the yeah. gate and talking about teen pregnancy. And it was adapted into a movie in 1992 called Gas Food Lodging, um, which I have oh, never yeah. heard of. You have? I've heard of the, I, I've oh. heard that I've watched the movie, but I've heard no, of the okay. movie out. Okay, 92. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, the editor-in-chief called him the day after he dropped the manuscript off and told him to immediately start working on his second Ooh, book. Yeah, wow. so it was that good. Nice. Um, he made sure that he kept understanding young kids by staying relevant and going to schools and libraries, giving writing workshops to students. And he admits this in one of the interviews that I saw, listening to kids talk in like places where they would congregate, such as like malls and everything. And I'm like, Richard. Um, <laughs> But the Blossom Cult books, of which we have one here, came to be whenever kids advised him to write a book with supernatural elements. Mm -hmm. So he created a book series about a teenage psychic girl named Blossom Cult. So this one... I think I've read um, any of those. Yeah, I was pretty um, interested to yeah. hear that, just because... I'm used to a long way from Chicago, right. a year down under, That's and thinking. books like that, um, which we're going to start talking about them <laughs> a long way from Chicago. I feel like that's the way you would know. Maybe yeah. not, but yeah, when I think Richard Peck, I think a long way from Chicago. Yeah, a long way from Chicago, he won the, well, he got the Newbery Honor Award for it, and it talks about his, the narrator's experience visiting um yearly throughout the summer his grandmother grandmother dowdle who is a very eccentric character um and just every it's really it, it was really easy for me to get into because each of the chapters is just a separate story that sort of helps create this like larger tapestry um so it was really easy for me to not have to worry about okay this happened then this happened you know um, so it was just a very easy read for me. And I fell in love, much like Richard Peck, with Grandma Dowdle. <laughs> and um, she's just fantastic. I think that her and Maurice Sendak would be... <laughs> they'd be... Um, 
fast friends, sure. I'd say. But they wouldn't um, admit it, because they don't like people. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't admit they liked each other. Yeah, I would say they would swipe right. <laughs> yes. Um, and then a year down under is, discusses the Mary, um, Mary Alice, the younger sister in A Long Way from Chicago, and her time with Grandma Dowdle. Um, it... Um, he talks about Grandma Dowdle and remarks that she is so much better as a grandmother instead of a mother. <laughs> and he mentions it. He um, asked one of the interviewers, he's like, well, would you prefer her to be a grandmother or a mother? And the kid confesses, oh, well, a grandmother. And he's like, of course she is. That's why I wrote her that way. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm um, So his last book, The Best Man, presents a young man who is experiencing homosexuality for the first time and his publishers describe the book as a story of small town life gay marriage and everyday heroes um this was after um soon after he had like publicly came out so do you know what year that one was published? Yeah, this months. was i believe 2016. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah yeah 2016. Okay. um and there is an interview of him talking, and it is like recently after the publication of the book and talking about him sort of tracking how far um, gay culture has yeah. come um, since being legally oppressed to the AIDS crisis, then to um, discussing the legality of gay marriage. Um, and yeah, it was really interesting he wrote more than 30 books for all ages, and he received the National Humanities Medal from George W. Bush and Laura Bush. Um, Laura Bush then invited Peck to be author in residence at three national book festivals at Washington. So Lori Hornick, um, obviously we also have, including or, um, for his awards, we have the Newbery Honor Award and then the Newbery Medal Award, both for... Mrs. Grandma Doddle's books. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lori Hornick, who was his editor um, for nearly 20 years, whenever she finally read the last chapter of Best Man to her, and this is a quote, she started crying and rushed over to hug him and said, yes, yes. And his response was, that's the best editorial feedback I've ever gotten. <laughs> Um, so obviously they had a close relationship, and it seemed as if their meetings were a lot more casual um, than normally, and it helped because he lived so close to the publishing company, which was in New York City. And it seemed as if people would just sort of naturally tell them his life story because he sort of made them feel so comfortable around him. Um, so, yeah, that is the Richard. bulk of Richard Peck. Yeah, so. nice. I love yeah. that. I love Richard Peck books. Like I said, I haven't read all. I've not read the newest one, which I really want to read now. But yeah, I read the first chapter, which deals with a wedding, and I was like, "Why is a wedding in the first chapter?" And this <laughs> is called Best Man. Um, but then it made a lot more sense whenever yeah. I kept reading it. <laughs> yeah. Um. So. So if you're not familiar with our podcast at this point. We tell who our authors will be for next month. So we kind of alternate. Since I did a picture book author this month, I will do the chapter book author mm -hmm. and vice versa. And I, we actually don't know who the other chose. We usually oh, know ahead of yes. time. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so who will the other well, famous professional switch? Who will the picture book author for next month be? I'm picking Kevin Hanks. Oh, okay. I love him. Okay, yeah. nice. All right. Well, our chapter book author for next month will be Jacqueline Woodson. Nice. Yes, I'm All right. excited about that. Gotcha. But thank you so much yeah. for listening. Um, we really uh, appreciate it, and we hope you have a and wonderful day. Thanks for coming, Casey. Yes, I'm a Thank you all for being so... I really do watch this podcast <laughs> every every time that they, they publish a new episode. But it's just all excitement about books. It makes me excited yeah. about books. Even if I've read them before, it makes me want to go back and read them again. So thank you all. Yeah, all definitely. Thanks. I really hope that we have put some on your reading list. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm going by the night kitchen. Just oh, good. Okay. You can check it out right after. I know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.